get ready to play your copy in three, two, one. Hi, I'm Dean Devlin, one of the co-writers of the film and one of the producers of the film. Hi, my name is Roland Emmerich. I'm the director of the movie and also a co-writer, right? I wrote that too, right? With you we wrote it together. <laughs> yeah, I vaguely remember. <clears throat> These opening credits were shot uh, with a motion control camera over a... Uh, um, what, was, what was this made out of, the, the mask? Well, the mask is like, uh, I think, fiberglass. It's like a sculpture, like uh, Patrick Topolis, uh uh, kind of designed and it was like uh, I think like kind of modeled in this workshop and and then we decided to kind of like shoot it with motion control so we get a lot of like depth of field. We had the feeling it's also like for some movie like this it's like very traditional to start in, on like kind of like art you know uh, in that case like Egyptian art. A quick story on the music here. Um, Roland and I had been working very hard on the final edit of the movie and had not slept in a while when we were flying out to London to record the music. When Roland turned to me and said, have uh, you heard any of the music on this movie? And I said, no, have you? He goes, not really. And we were terrified because we didn't know if the music was going to be good or not because David Arnold had not at this point really scored an entire feature film. Uh, and we were incredibly exhausted when we showed up into the uh, scoring stage. And when these opening credits started and he started this... Uh, the, the overture, we were absolutely blown away by the music he had done and, and we were convinced that he had elevated the film to a whole other level. It's still, I think, the best score he's ever done. If you notice, the music changes right there on Joseph Perot's credit. And because of that, we nicknamed him from that moment on the evil Joseph Perot, even though he's not evil. Maybe a little bit. There's a lot of kind of Germans in that credits. There was like kind of a uh, German production designer and now comes uh, was the German uh, cameraman. This is my sister. So it was like a German, uh, Egyptian, uh, Lebanese. Mario is coming, Mario Kassar comes from Lebanon. You know, very international production. By the way, like kind of produced by a French uh, company mm -hmm. called Canal Plus. There was my first producing credit ever. You hear this like subtle gong in uh, the music. <laughs> now this dissolve is actually taking us into uh, what was in the uh, in the released version was used as a flashback. But originally we had intended to open the movie with the scene. Later, uh, when we were testing the film. We were trying to uh, shorten the film and, and, and uh, really kind of squeeze it down into a, a shorter, faster version. So this, this scene got lost. But it was always a, a, an interesting way to open the movie and to introduce uh, who Ra was before, before he was taken by the aliens. This is a combination of model shots and a, and a set we built uh, in uh, Yuma, Arizona which is uh, actually in the same kind of valley, you know, like where we shot the scene, also like Rambo 2 was shot. Now, if you notice carefully, you never see Jay Davison's nipples in these shots. The reason is he refused to take his nipple rings out. So we had covered them with tape to try and show... Now, this shot actually from behind is another actor named Dax, who, uh, uh, who, who originally was playing him as a young boy. But later, it was confusing to have two different actors playing the same part, so we, we reshot some of that with Jay Davison. And this is the moment when Jay Davison is taken by the aliens. Now, in this shot, the pyramids and the sun are actually, and, and the Nile and the boat, are all put in digitally. That was actually all shot in, uh, in Arizona. Also, there was like kind of this one palm tree in the shot, which uh, was like kind of dying by the time we were like kind of coming to the set, and uh, we had to put digitally like kind of leaves in, so it kind of looked a little bit fuller. Now, if you look closely at the extras in the distance, you'll see they move very, very little movements. That's because they're actually sticks stuck into cans of cement with cloth hanging over it, because we had a limited budget for extras. So all the live extras we tried to put into the pit, and in the distance we, we used uh, stick figures. This, uh, again, was like shot in Yuma, Arizona. Uh, it was a, quite a huge set, um, had to be kind of a lot of kind of uh, 
earth had to be moved, you know, to kind of uh, make this happen. And um, here, like, kind of, they're now, like, kind of standing at this uh, big tablet, you know, which was made out of foam. This little girl was really wonderful. Yeah. And here we introduce the first, like, kind of main symbol of the, of the movie, which is the Eye of Ra. This is one of my favorite shots of the movie, actually, right here. Carl Walter Lindenlove was the DP, and he did really a fantastic job on this movie. Also, the whole scene, you know, was... Uh, uh, the concept was, like, kind of to shoot the whole uh, sequence over, like, three days only in the late sun, you know, short before the sun sets, you know, to get this, like, kind of golden, like, Egyptian look. Because uh, we had the feeling that, like, kind of that's the what the people connect the most with, like, uh, Egypt is like this, like... Uh, very like kind of uh, warm, you know, evening sun. Originally, the Stargate was painted black, and it looked like a giant tire, and we had to have it repainted yeah. at the last moment. In the last moment, we throw some silver and other stuff on it. Now, this portion here, this was actually edited out of the the released version, which is where we tried to introduce the idea that after the Stargate had been buried, someone had tried to come back through it and and the guards, uh, uh, Anubis and Horus, had been actually beamed into, directly into stone, which is why they were petrified here. Which also gives you a first like, foreshadowing of like, uh, Anubis and, and the Horus character. Again, in the length of time is part of the reason why we had, we had cut it in the release version. This now was shot like here in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, it's like a hotel in uh, downtown Los Angeles, which uh, is often used for like kind of uh, for movies in all kind of different ways. That's Vivica Limford, and this was actually her last film before she died. She did a marvelous performance in the film. Covered with detailed hieroglyphics. When is the academic community going to accept the fact the pharaohs of the fourth dynasty did not build the great? This was actually a scene where like a lot of problems with uh, because actually it was a scene which explained much more but then like during editing we realized the scene is like kind of way too long so we had to do a lot of work you know and like kind of bring this down to a feasible length yes originally we tried to explain a lot of the theories regarding did aliens build the pyramids or not in this scene but the scene went on far too long this is actually here this gentleman uh, which you saw for a second uh, was like our floor effect supervisor an english fellow he, he's talking here again it's Kit West, he did the floor effects, and uh, it's a very fa famous, like, uh, 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 floor effects uh, supervisor. Won an Oscar, I think, for one of the Star Wars. Uh, uh, Indiana Jones. Or Indiana Jones. He was um, nominated, I think, four or five times. I mean, I've, I've been able to show a fully developed writing system. Some of my favorite stuff with, with James Spader is this early stuff where he... In some way, I think it really kind of taps into into him. Uh, he, he's a very smart guy and somewhat intellectual and <laughs> sometimes loses track of what's going on around. <laughs> I think he played these scenes just beautifully. That was my, one of my early uh, rain scenes. <laughs> I always like try to pack in like a, a rain scene in every movie because I love rain. And uh, it's probably my like, German upbringing. And uh, in Godzilla, it ended up that I did the whole movie in rain. So now, like, uh, Dean, every time I'm, like, only mentioning Ren in a movie, he's, like, <laughs> he's, like, uh, uh, gives me that look. Are we going somewhere? You're going to be fine. We'll take care of these. Jackson, those your parents. What photograph was that? I never got that. <laughs> this photograph where that came, came from. This again was a, one of our Morris the Explainer scenes trying to shove in some character exposition before the adventure began. Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's also the typical call, call for adventure in a scene where like kind of you see first a character in his like daily life and then all of a sudden you know some people show up and all of a sudden you know he gets uh, you know you know, asked to do something else, which kind of brings us uh, brings him into the adventure. 
And because she kind of like tells him several things he's really interested at, you know. You know. What's this? Travel plans. He kind of like kind of decides to take this job. It's also nice with the music here, where you like, and somewhat like kind of feel that he's not sure what he should like kind of make of the situation and if he should go or not. One of the unusual things that David Arnold, the composer, did was he actually came to the set when we were shooting and interviewed the actors, and they told him certain secrets about their characters that they wouldn't even say to Roland and I, and David was able to use that in the music to bring out uh, uh, some depth to who they were. This was like a set built on stage. We do this a lot that we kind of built like smaller uh, kind of sets on stage. Not because, you know, of a special look, because it looks pretty ordinary, but it's like kind of like helps us to, you know, for the shooting schedule to kind of get more scenes done, you know, because like uh, sometimes you collect two or three kind of smaller sets and shoot like scenes you normally would like shoot in three or four days. You can shoot pretty much like in half of the time. This was a very important story element for us, which is the idea of a man who, who's left the military after his son was killed uh, playing with a gun that was laying out. And uh, and now the, uh, the father is somewhat suicidal. So when he's given the mission, even though he's told he may never return, it's okay with him because uh, it would solve his, his, his problems with suicide, but it also made him a very dangerous person on the mission. Excuse me, Colonel O'Neill. We're from General West's office. Kurt Russell is one of the most underrated actors of our time. He's really a fantastic actor and does so much with so little. It's amazing. We are here to inform you that you've been reactivated. Also, like a lot of people, I like, kind of commented uh, on that, like uh, this scene, we had to kind of shoot. We had to shoot like kind of before all other scenes because he has long hair. Right. And it was like kind of weird for him because. Uh, he came like kind of pretty much first time, you know, like first shooting day, and he had to kind of shoot that scene, you know, which was for him quite uh, to jump right into it. And uh, from that moment on, you know, like uh, there was like for two or three weeks, like kind of only one discussion. There was the hair color of Kurt, <laughs> you know, because he wanted to have a lighter tone in his hair uh, and his hair cut. Which I think like in one newspaper, they like kind of, but they always like kind of vote for the. Te- 10 or 100 t- dumbest thing done by Hollywood was like Kurt Russell's haircut for Stargate. <laughs> so here now, like, kind of it's one of our biggest sets. That's only part of the set, but like, let me see how big it is. There's Richard Kind, who you may know from uh, Spin City or Mad About You. Yeah. He's marvelous in this film, doing a small part for us. And there are the tablets. The magical mystery tablets that has drawn James Spader's character into this. And if you just watch the way Spader plays this scene, I mean, you can really see what a subtle actor he is. I mean, he, 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 he really makes you believe that this is a guy who could become obsessed with an idea, a thought. Okay, Jack. Hello. 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 This... <laughs> Where'd you find this? <laughs> Giza Plateau, 1928. The character Vivica Place was actually based on a woman we watched in a uh, documentary about one of the uh, uh, temples in Egypt, a woman who had been uh, uh, studying the temples since she was a child when her father had studied at the same temple. It's got writing unlike we've ever found before. Those aren't hieroglyphics. Might be some form of hieratic or maybe cuneiform. Well, the translation of the inner track is wrong. Was it like in a, in a way it's like a... Excuse me. Uh, like James Spader is uh, like more than champion. It was like kind of the fellow who kind of like deciphered the first time hieroglyphs, and he was like kind of the only guy who could really write fast in in hieroglyphics. Which uh, he was like a genius of its time, and uh, and we always like kind of based James' character a little bit on that. His main forte is like kind of translation and his languages, and he's simply so fluent in it that he kind of sees things differently or, or in a different way than everybody else. Now, by the way, all the Egyptian written on there is is actually as accurate as we could be. We, uh, Dr. Stuart Smith had joined us on the movie and ac- helped us recreate ancient Egyptian, uh, both in all the hieroglyphics you see in the movie, but in actually in the dialogue. We uh, Later in the film, we had the actors learn 
uh, our best guess of what ancient Egyptians sounded like to recreate the language. Afternoon, Colonel. Which was strange later, and we kind of started, uh, sh uh, you know, editing the movie because we were really kind of didn't cut anything off. You know, even nobody understands. We always like kind of followed actually the the scripts. You know, which um, Stuart. G Here we saw, by the way, for you know the first time, like Kurt Russell's haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I think it looked great. I think it was I a real so daring too, choice. But like some people were like really shocked about it. But perhaps like kind of the never seen Kurt, you know, with hair like that. So, but for him, it was really important to have this kind of totally different look. You know, it was really important for him. And it tells you a lot about him. Catherine, what's going on here? I'm not sure. Colonel O'Neill, I think you owe me an explanation. I was told I had complete autonomy. Plans change. Why are you here? Why did they bring you on this project? I'm here in case you succeed. <laughs> Completed search of Canaia form, another pre dynastic this like actually was like shot in the mountains in uh, somewhere like kind of the, the mountains behind Los Angeles <laughs> by, a, by a second unit crew. All this kind of section is like kind of uh, shot on stage. We kind of uh, had this problem for this movie that we had huge sets, not only like kind of the sets uh, here, you know, like, uh, but also later the big Egyptian sets. So we looked forever for like a stage, you know, and then we found this like huge dome in Long Beach next to the Queen Mary where the Spoos Goose, the biggest, you know, this big plane by, built by Howard Hughes was in and they kind of like put this like uh, to Portland to another, uh, another, to, to another museum and this there was this huge empty space and um, it was the ideal, uh, you know, studio space. It's huge. And uh, since like we discovered it, like kind of they shot Batman in there, they shot, uh, they're right now shooting like uh, Jan de Bond's new movie. It's kind of uh, very kind of popular now as a studio, studio space. The actor space. that uh, um, James Spader <coughs> took the newspaper from in that previous scene was actually his driver on the picture. <laughs> and the brother of Susan Sarandon. And the brother of Susan Sarandon, that's yeah. correct. One of my favorite little pieces of music right here. I think the music really was fabulous on this movie. And for fans of Centropolis movies or TV shows, uh, <laughs> we bring in uh, our actor Leon Rippey, who's been in uh, many of our films in different forms. He chose, however, to have this strange little mustache I mean, the, the strange hair thing, and <laughs> it, it seemed and he, very Hitler-like for he, some reason. He looks like Adolf Hitler, and the first time I saw him, I said, you know what, you look like Adolf, and from that moment on, you know, I called him that. He was not very happy about that. <laughs> but he's a marvelous actor. They couldn't solve in two years. Two years? Again, this was one of the scenes where we have to explain a lot, and, and I think, like, kind of James Peter does a great job in uh, playing the... You know, this like uh, distract, you know, uh, guy who is like kind of totally in his own thoughts and own ideas and, and, and kind of makes this scene a little bit more about character than only about uh, the information you get. In a science fiction film, these are always the hardest scenes to act in. that you would believe to be words to be translated were, in fact, were, in fact, star constellations. Now, these constellations were placed in a unique order, forming a map or an address of sorts. Seven points to outline a course to a position. And um, to find a destination within any three-dimensional space, we need... This was actually like I was writing the script. It's how I try to explain to Dean... <laughs> How we could like kind of show what uh, uh, how the symbol actually works, well, you know. Six for the destination, but to chart a course, you need a point of origin. Except 
There's only six symbols in the cartouche. Well, the seventh actually isn't inside the cartouche. It's just. That's really here. that's here great. How like kind of James does this and makes it light and funny. It's this little nervous laugh he does here that always killed me, though. It never got a laugh in the theater. <laughs> funny little. <line. laughs> I don't know why that always cracks me up. <laughs> <laughs> he did it. No, that symbol isn't anywhere on the device. Why? Well, what device? Huh? <clears throat> there, in classic Kurt Russell style, with just a look, he shows you that he's more in charge than his own boss. Sign of a guy who can do a lot with very little. This is here now, like a typical genre, science fiction genre moment. The magic moment. And again, this theme music here is just spectacular. Instead of just looking at a piece of metal, it suddenly uh, suggests magic, it suggests travel, it suggests adventure. All through the way it's shot, edited, and, and the music. Come, Jax. Monitors up. Monitors are up. Mitch, you want to bring up the details on the center monitor, please? Yeah. Fans of The Visitor will recognize Mitch as one of the actors from uh, The Visitor, playing one of the, he played one of the FBI guys. Also had a small part in Independence Day. That's John's story. Hold it. Wait. Do you have a, uh... Oh, yeah, sorry. Hey, 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 don't! Two figures on either side, praying beside a pyramid with the sun directly above it. He's right. That was in front of us the whole time. General West, Jackson has identified the seventh symbol. Go ahead. Programming seventh symbol into computer. Chevron 1 is they still use these same graphics on the TV series today every time the darn thing starts yeah. up. <laughs> we have nothing to do with the television series. <laughs> Let me clear that up right now. We have nothing to do with the TV series. Chevron 2 is holding. Engage. Chevron 2 is locked. This is also like a sequence where it's very complicated to shoot because uh, the... The, the Stargate itself was this big kind of mechanical monstrum, which like kind of K K Kid West, the floor effect supervisor, we saw early in the movie, you know, built. And uh, uh, it always had to kind of like be pumped up. The hydraulic had to be pumped up. And, and everywhere, like there were these shakers in the set, so to kind of like shake the whole set. So this was for the actors really hard because it made tons of noise. And they had to kind of, uh, kind of speak over it, but also not too loud, you know. And they also kind of like always with a shock, then realize, oh, I have to loop that whole scene. So you know, it's always hard for for actors, you know, to do this scene because the the mechanical part of the movie nearly takes over. But I think they're all doing a great job. And here, one of the best effects in the movie, and something that at this point you had not really seen in a movie before. Also, we kind of we discussed to kind of do like. Um, you know, like, uh, should we do this, like, kind of uh, uh, CG? You know, should we kind of do this computer generator? And then we kind of decided, no, let's go with, with organic elements. So what we did, we kind of had this, like, big, big uh, glass tube. And uh, we simply plunged something into the water. And what happens when a big object falls into the water, it makes this kind of weird, you know, like, kind of, like, thing. And, and, and why we were sh showing something in, we pumped a lot of air in it and it kind of you know created this kind of like great form so 
And the other thing was only like steering the, 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 the back in the Stargate, you know, it's supposed to be called it strudel because it's a German uh, word for this kind of like form. You know, we did like in simply steering, you know, water and uh, filming it from down under. This robot is actually a real probe that they used for uh, uh, getting things out of contaminated environments or packages that they think may be bombs. Mm -hmm. And now you kind of see CG water because for all the water service now, we, you know, it was better to get more detail with like, uh, with like kind of computer generated water. And because also it is like much easier can interact with uh, objects, also it has to stand upright. And I think they did a, gr a great job in matching, you know, the, the, the real water with the, with the, with the uh, computer generated water. This was like a little instrument which was only pulled by some guy down under on two strings. <laughs> and with a little sound, it looks somewhat convincing. It's all these little things where you try to save money in movies, you know, that you don't build for everything a mechanic, so try to move whatever you can with strings or by hand or... In the Kalium Galaxy. It has mass. It could be a moon or a large asteroid. I swear to like God she says asterisk there. It's yeah. asteroid. Everyone else says she says asteroid. Every time I hear it, I hear her say yeah. a large asterisk. You know. <laughs> and she is actually the wife of the DP. <laughs> <laughs> but, a, but a wonderful actress. Yeah, and she's and been an actress a long time before yeah. they were married. Side of the known universe. We're losing the signal. This is the information the probe sent back to us. Freeze and enhance. You can clearly see the gate on the other side. Both gates must have functioned as a doorway between our worlds. This actor here is, is uh, David Pressman, who has died in almost every film we've ever made. <laughs> but in this one, he's so wise because you never know what will happen to him. But perhaps you, know, you never know. The sequel. Different. They don't match the symbols on our gate. That's why we may have to abort. This project is for naught without a reconnaissance mission. Once on the other side, we'd have to decipher the markings on their gate, and in essence, dial home, in order to bring. It's again, where we like kind of set up the mission, where we explain, you know. We can do that. Well, I could do that. Big moment. I always like this kind of tracking. Are you sure? And where we also try to establish that Kurt Russell is uneasy about having the scientists on his team. <laughs> that was a loop line he did later that <laughs> it was just perfect. You're on the team. Now this scene was originally cut out of the um, theatrical version. Uh, but again, it was to show how that his part of the military team, or he in particular, knew something that the others didn't, which was a, that there was a potential danger on the other side of the Stargate. Whatever these things were that had beamed through and had been beamed directly into rock were a potential threat. And so he still wanted to study that. So here we see his character facing what he may have to face on the other side. So then here we see like, um what we saw at the very beginning when they got the Stargate, we see again the, the how you call this, like the fossil. The fossil. This was fo the, well, uh, the idea that it, they had tried to beam through the Stargate, but the Stargate was buried in stone, so they beamed directly into stone and became instant fossils. That's why I wanted you, Jack. We've opened a doorway to a world we know nothing about. It's like an actually this this piece was like carved uh, by like Patrick Atopoulos who also designed, you know, all the the Egyptian masks uh, for Horus Anubis and uh, Ra mask. And it still hangs on the wall of my house. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I, I. Yes. I found it with Stargate when I was a child. It has brought me luck. I always like this scene. So it's so nice when you can when you find some some sort of like kind of symbol or some some object which kind of you carry throughout you know through the movie where you like kind of first uh, you see it with the little girl that you find you know when they kind of in the in Egypt you see it now and then later it all of a sudden gets becomes like uh, really important in the for the plot of the movie. On. 
This is the typical kind of humor that Roland and I like the best. In the, in the middle of a dramatic sequence or, or a, something that has, has a lot of self-importance, just something that's just a little bit off-kilter. This was like not a scene where like uh, all the team, you know, the sample team has to go like the first time through the Stargate and um, and it was like really interesting because all the actors naturally ask you, you know, how do I go through this thing and uh, what we kind of decided or what I told them is like the best is, uh, you know, nobody ever went through that thing so there is no like kind of rule. So the best is, you know, you like kind of do it like you as you character, you you know, uh, would do it, you know, that means, you know, uh, like kind of Kurt, you know, do it like kind of, you think, you know, like uh, this, uh, what was his character's name? Uh, O'Neill. O'Neill, you know, would do it and uh, the same, said the same thing uh, to James Spader and, and then we were simply rehearsing the scene, you know, and um, watched them, you know, doing, doing it. Fans of Third Rock from the Sun will notice that one of our uh, soldiers here is uh, actually plays an alien on Third Rock from the Sun. See, and now you see that like kind of Kurt, you know, like simply goes with one kind of decisive step. Grits his teeth. Through it and grits his teeth and puts his weapons in there first. Actor Steve Gianelli kissing his kind of <laughs> St. Christopher kind of medal. Yeah. <laughs> Now, none of this was scripted, this whole sequence here, and I think this reveals a lot about who they are, and, and again, mm. showed how Roland worked with the actors to create these wonderful moments, and this particular moment right here is my favorite moment in the entire movie, and it was not in the script. It was just created between Roland and, and the actor on set. Of course, the special effects people were screaming, no, no, the effect will never hold this long, we can't do it this way. And Roland said, no, you know, no. Actually, <laughs> Jeff Oaken, who did the, was the visual effects supervisor, was like kind of standing with a stopwatch next to it and said, you know how long that was? <laughs> And actually, you know, but that's the magic of it, you know, and uh, without that it would have never worked. And it shows that like kind of James Bader character is uh, a guy about who's uh, fascinated about things and is in a way, you know, has like kind of this, this fast, you know, uh, the fascination a child has with things, you know, when he sees something new. This effect is the one that got the largest reaction in the theater. Uh, nearly every time it played when it first came out, uh, there that's was applause of, at the end of the sequence. That's kind of very simply done. We didn't like wanted to overdo it. It was like more the the the, the, the speed and the sound, especially you know, which yes. made this uh, effect happen. Jackson, all right, it's over. Stay with him. Jackson, just listen. To me. Keep moving. Where's off in the back? Recognize him? <laughs> now, if you notice here that we, we put little ice crystals on them, that somehow in the reforming of the, the atoms, that uh, uh, a great deal of cold would happen and, and would affect them in, in, in a way, but that it wears off very quickly. Yeah. And these were the flares, you know, they kind of like constructed extra for this movie, and it was uh, a nightmare <laughs> to shoot with them. First of all, the actors were so scared of them. <laughs> Secondly, they went out fast, so everything had to be timed. How long will the flare in the light? Because we decided here not to use any other light than these flares, which gives the whole movie, you know, uh, the whole scene, like a really cool look. You know, you have only flashlights and these flares, you know, and it looks, I think, like incredible. These sets were the most beautiful sets. As, as great as they look on film, they were even more beautiful when you were there actually shooting them. Well, this special set was like kind of relatively simple, but uh, uh, this one now is like kind of the first like bigger like stone chamber. But we also at the very beginning didn't want it to show too much like kind of uh, in that moment like wide shots because we kn knew that like kind of the real kind of uh, big moment comes outside. So we kept this all like pretty in close shots and then wanted to go you know and go step by step revealing more and more I want to take a look around 
This was one of the things, you know, that like kind of we decided to kind of put them sunglasses on because we were scouting in Yuma and we were building sets there. We knew how bright it was there. So it like helped the actors enormously to, because it was so hot. Now, even though when you see the wide shot here, uh, 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 the entrance looks like only, it's only part of it, but actually the entrance itself was built in real and that was already seven stories tall. Everything above that, the pyramid, uh, the pyramid above that was, uh, we would do either digitally or with a model composited. Mm. There's the entrance. That was all real. And what also, like, we had to do, we had to build it in the middle of the desert. So we had to build, like, kind of roads in the desert. And everybody told us it's nearly impossible. And then our location manager, uh, Ken Fix, actually found out that the military kind of developed these, like... Uh, Temporary roads. Yeah, these, like, m plastic grids. You can roll out it, roll out, and then you, like, sprinkle them with water on, a, on a, like, every, like, kind of 12 hours. And they s simply keep the consistency of, like, a, of a road. Most people miss that in this shot there's actually three moons. Uh, but the whole point of having the three moons was to make it really clear that we're on a, a, another planet, that this is not just Earth, this is not just time travel. Then some people the, miss that. Then all these scenes, you know, I have to imagine were like kind of shot in sand and it had to be totally pristine sand, you know, they, you couldn't see any footsteps, you know. Or if you see footsteps, only some of them because they, they just arrived. So this was, when you like shoot with a 150 people crew, you know, you have to kind of like uh, find ways, you know, that they only can work, uh, walk on certain like little paths, you know. And then we had like sand sweepers, so I think we had like 30 of them. But that never looked the same. But it never quite looked the same. And to specially create like kind of this like kind of really pristine look around the set, because naturally the set got not finished as early as we wanted. So we brought in a, a, a kind of... Um, uh, engine or a jet engine of like a, a how you call it? Was it jet engine? Tr yeah, jet engine. You know, and blew like for three or four days. You know, like this strong wind into this uh, into this like uh, sand ball to ke keep it like uh, you know as pristine looking as possible. And then some sometimes we corrected a little bit with the computer and ma um, erased some like kind of marks or you know little you know like kind of footsteps we saw in the background. Classically, the storytelling of this movie is, is that of a stranded story. If you think of someone who's stranded on a desert island or, you know, the, the uh, Swiss Family Robinson kind of story. And this is the moment when we discover that, that they're stranded on this planet, that while the machine can bring them back, he doesn't know how to make the machine do it. You assumed. You're a lion, son of a bitch! You didn't say a word about finding anything! Kowalski, set up a camp down here. Organize our supplies. Sir, you've got your orders. <laughs> you know, I can't believe we're stuck here. No, all this was shot like in Yuma, Arizona, and it was the hottest place on Earth. 123 degrees in the shade. It was like uh, really murderous and... Uh, uh, it's amazing how, how the, the crew and the actors, you know, kind of dealt with it. We had um, special people who did nothing else than handing out water. Uh, because, like, some people also, like, you know, because they were, like, work and do their thing, you know, they kind of um, forget to drink. And uh, we had several people all of a sudden pass out be uh, um, because they're dehydrated. Another thing was like kind of, uh, I mean, it's like kind of the songs which right now on radio, like uh, always wear sun, sunblock. I mean, some people, you know, had like shorts on, you know, and only the, the refraction of the sand got like kind of like uh, sun, sunburn in places that never got sunburns before. It was really amazing. This group of actors who played the other soldiers, uh, we had to cut some of their stuff out uh, when the movie was released. But uh, luckily here, we're, we were able to put some of the scenes back, as you'll see as, as we go on. But they were really terrific. Isn't there something you should be doing right now? Like, getting us out of here? Again, a scene just to isolate uh, James Bader's character from the rest of them. Foot power. This scene is to establish that Kurt Russell has an agenda that the others don't know about, which is that he has this nuclear weapon that he has hidden 
that in the event he, he perceives a danger could come through the Stargate and he- head back to Earth, he has the permission to, to blow up the Stargate to prevent that danger from coming to Earth. But uh, it's a charge that he has that none of the other stol- soldiers are aware of. Base camp is up, sir. That being the key he just palmed. These are the kind of scenes that I think James Bader just really did great. I, I, just, I just love him as the, the outcast scientist. I've never really seen him play anything like this. And this is when he notices the footsteps of the mastage. So now we first time see this animal we call the mastage, a uh, mastage. 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 And that was a Clydesdale horse, actually, in a suit that had a mechanical head. So the head that you're seeing being manipulated is being done through mechanics. Yeah. But it's most, actually sitting on a Clydesdale yeah, horse. Most, when you see it on a white shot, and, uh, when you see, like, only the head, it's like kind of a contraption uh, they built, you know, where you, like, have a, a kind of cable-controlled head. For example, here, you know, they build a little crane, which is, like, kind of works as the, as the you know, like, which holds the head and could do quite kind of amazing movements. And Frank Welliker did the... The voice of the master, the, all these growlings and things. Again, this kind of uh, animal was designed also by Patrick Tetopoulos, which in this movie worked the first time in, and then he did la- later on did like kind of uh, uh, Independence Day and Godzilla with us. Yeah, I love this creature. <laughs> I wouldn't feed that thing. It's got a harness. <laughs> Domesticated. And again, one of the better themes of music in the movie. Now, this technique is done a variety of ways. Partially, we, we had a, a, a stunt guy pulled by string. There is actually a... A, a little dog with a in suit. a suit with the puppets. This one, too. Which was like a little dog, and he had this like suit, and uh, there was like a second unit crew like dealing with this <laughs> for like four weeks. Now, now that one was actually the, the horse pulling, yeah, yeah, pulling uh, yeah. the stuntman. Yeah, this that one's also, yeah, this, this one too. But whenever you see it very wide, you know. There, that's the dog. That's the dog. You can kind of tell if you really yeah. look at the legs. Yeah. Here too, it's the dog uh, with a little puppet. It's uh, where we're like... Uh, this is the ew scene. Yeah. Where everyone in the audience went... <laughs> The French kissing mastage. Again, and you know, I was like, kind of want to, you know, remember everybody. Just like every time we had to shoot a scene like this, you know, was this uh, this thing? Can we? How many times can we do the wide shot? Because whenever we do once a wide shot, and we have all these footsteps, we had to move the whole setup, you know, like at least sandbag. like out of fifty or sixty, a hundred feet to the left, so we don't have any kind of footsteps again and have pristine sand again. I love this that This was shot. like kind of a, a kind of down there, this is a set and then the people is like kind of digital and the background of the towers is like uh, digital. And this was actually a huge like stone quarry we like used and dressed. This was uh, the day where we had the most extras, we had 1800 extras and probably like kind of 2000 stick people. And stick the most people. mastages. Yeah, and the most mastages. And, and these leathers, and it was like kind of quite a big uh, undertaking. It was also our first day of shooting it was in our Yuma. first day of shooting, and when I kind of proposed this as the first day, everybody kind of said, oh, you, you must be crazy. But I thought it's always good to start with the, fir- the biggest scene first, you know, because uh, everybody's fresh, everybody's well organized, everybody has his uh, stuff together. This is the introduction of Skara, played by Alexis Cruz, who did a, a marvelous job. Uh, in portraying the sympathetic uh, native when he had no language to use. He had to, again, learn this interpretation of ancient Egyptian. And and that was really his only tools to communicate other than his, his expressions. And he did a fantastic job in the movie. 
the design of those cores are actually based on the Brazilian uh, uh, mines, the uh, photographs we had seen. Gold of the mines. Br the Brazilian gold mines. All right, Jackson. You're on. Me? This scene always cracked me up. I mean, if you actually did meet another culture from an, another planet, yeah, what would you say to them? And he says, hi. <laughs> And then from very classic movies, as Roland pointed out earlier, we were able to use the locket as the bridge between them. This uh, scene is a little bit inspired by the man who would be king. Yes. Uh, we kind of looked at kind of... If you look really closely, you can see the extras in the, in the background bowing on the first level and then the second level. Yeah. This was like 1,800 people. It was uh, the movie in a, in a in a way is like not only a stranded story; it's also like a travelogue. You see, kind of people people traveling somewhere and then traveling from place to place. And then the man who would be king uh, is one, I, my, one of my all-time favorite, like kind of travelogue films. Absolutely. Hey, hmm? it's okay. Their like, first contact. Their first contact, and he's like kind of he's pretty much the leader of the shepherd boys we called them, and this was like a group of like uh, I don't know like twenty Mexican kids of that area because we looked we looked for people who like have like a dark look and dark hair, and they became like kind of <laughs> the the like for the first aid, the first assistant director the you know like kind of it was always when like we said like shepherd boys have to be there everybody rolled his eyes because they were kids they were 14 15 16 17 year old kids and they always wanted to have fun you know and they were not you know the easiest to keep quiet the idea being that that the, their role is that they they took care of the mastages that they mm -hmm. they shepherded the mastages and there was one of the more complicated ones because not only did we have our, our, our horse with the suit on, but we had to put the actor on top of the horse with the suit. So this was yeah. it's not easy to do. And you see it at, at, at him, he's like not so sure about, about it. You know, it's very kind of careful how he gets down from this thing. This is the character of Kasuf. Again, a marvelous job of acting to, to, to relay the humor and yet make you feel like this is another planet. Hey, you. Hey, you. Yahweh Mahatib, Yanak Hasu, Bayakak Nam. I can't make it out. Sounds familiar, a bit like Berber. Maybe Chadak or Amadak. You may rec recognize him as the guy who bumps his head in the opening of Independence Day. <laughs> And this was Mili Avital, who, who uh, this was her first American film, but she had actually been a star in, in uh, Israel before she came out. I had really trouble casting that part because we always looked for, uh, for somebody, you know, who like uh, has this kind of feel of, um, you know, like a girl who could come from Egypt and we kind of like read a lot of act actors. And then uh, I think we were already shooting and we still hadn't decided yet. And... Uh, and our casting director kind of brought this like tape of this uh, movie from Israel, and we pretty much like said that's the girl, and and we then we wanted to kind of like said how we get her from Israel to kind of Yuma, Arizona. And then we found out she actually lived and went to uh, acting school, acting classes in New York, and so she, one day later she was like out there in the desert, and after her, you know we met with her, she, we immediately sent her into makeup and hair and and, and costume, and kind of she had. You know, she was like kind of pretty much hired on the spot, on the set. She's actually part Egyptian, part uh, Israeli, mm -hmm. which made her somehow uniquely perfect for this role. See, Bru? He's inviting us to go with him. I can be so sure. <laughs> inviting us to go with him. We were looking for signs of civilization. Obviously, we found it. You want me to get us back home? This is our best shot. Colonel Lee's right. I took some readings on what they were mining back then. They're the same material as the Stargate. Radio base camp. Tell them to keep that area secured until we get back. Again, this was one of the scenes that did not make it into the uh, into the release, but it was just again to give a little bit of character and, and give you a bit of feeling of who these guys were. 
repeat that, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. So what's the story? What's happening? What's going what? They're not coming back. Okay. I like French. It's really kind of great actor. Speaking of the travelogue, this is one of the sequences where you really get the feeling of all the extras marching their way across the desert. A, a gorgeous shot right there. Again, it was uh, logistically kind of uh, quite undertaking, and the, the, the assistant directors did a great job in this movie. They are the shepherd boys with the mass stage. You, you. Now, the towers in the middle, those are real, and those were built uh, yeah. right there in the desert. And the rest is like a, is a composite from uh, models, you know, then in the computer, we kind of filmed different towers and then multiplied them and... and uh, but like a part, you know, the, the, the gates itself, you know, and the two, two front towers, you know, they're, they're like a, a set. So here, for example, when you see the message on the, on the right side, for, for a moment, you know, it's actually like kind of uh, only the head, you know, like on tracks, you know, kind of uh, pushed, you know, with the actors. Because it's just too complicated with the horses to do these kind of things. Another one of my favorite shots, this crane shot through the towers, where you really get a sense of the village. The set was pretty much like kind of designed to do that shot, you know, we tried it out in the model and uh, you have to kind of plan these things like pretty accurately, so. Also again, you know, we tried to kind of shoot all these scenes late in the day, so we get this like kind of really beautiful light. And again, the music is expansive and gives you the real epic feel. And now the symbol that connects our heroes to the other world. And the theme of the villain character begins playing. There's a kind of the sound people mish some kind of animal sound in there to kind of make it more kind of like ominous, ominous and dangerous. It's the Egyptian stuff. Holger Gross was our production designer. Did a did fantastic a, job. Yeah, so. terrific job. Yeah. It was very kind of. Uh, you know, in every when you went into the sets and saw the sets, you know, in real, it was like kind of. Uh, didn't look like sets at all because they kind of put so much like kind of work into making the walls really look like stone and uh, they did a terrific jo job. All these kind of towers were pretty much like kind of carved in, uh, in foam and uh, then these big foam pieces were applied to the set, you know, and uh, we used like kind of so much scaffolding, which means like metal you know, construction, you know, that like there's one company, you know, like uh, actually some English fellows, you know, who do that and they, we, we kind of needed so much, you know, of this like kind of uh, metal that they had to kind of get another sh ship full of it, you know, to America from England, you know, extra for this movie. Now, here we're about to see another scene that was cut out of the, uh, out of the film. We're going back right now. This is their attempt to leave, but the doors are shut, and the doors are shut because a sandstorm is coming. But they don't know it. So the only thing they get like kind of like locked in and so it kind of helps a little bit to to kind of like the scar at the one of the shepherd boys, you know, because he's pretty fearless and I think he somewhat like gets, you know, that it's important to explain them what's happening. And it kind of forms like some kind of bond between him and uh, and uh, Kurt's character. Right. I think this part was in it. It's just the last part that, that mm -hmm. had been cut out. Mm -hmm. I think that we've included it in this. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> This was actually a model, you know, the sandstorm shot. 
Which we should also in Yuma, Arizona. Yeah, this part here. Well, that would have been an excellent reason to shoot everyone. We'll stay until it's over. All these kind of things were improvised. <laughs> John Deal. He's yeah. just a big, lovable teddy bear. <laughs> That's again a model shot. Where'd that come from? Kowalski, Brown, do you read? Again a model shot. Now this scene is is a. A, a loose homage to one of the Indiana Jones films when they they go to into their into the dinner sequence to have a a, a bizarre yeah, meal. Which again, like they did a homage to all these kind of movies about adventurers being Absolutely. somewhere in Africa or like in some like kind of odd place on this earth and have to eat like uh, native food. <laughs> the performers do such a great job in this scene. Well, we don't want to offend them, now do we, Daniel? <laughs> the sound makes it just that much more icky. It's a chicken. It's a chicken. It's good. Tastes. They don't have chicken on that planet, so. Tastes like chicken. <laughs> Tastes like chicken. Good. <laughs> Jackson. You said that was an Egyptian symbol. Yeah, the eye of Ra. Would you say then that it might stand to reason if they know one Egyptian symbol? Yes. You? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, no. The, all these kind of like scenes are actually my favorite scenes uh, of the movie because they kind of show how like kind of people trying to communicate, which is always something where you can't use much language, not much dialogue. You have to do everything, you know, if uh, they have to act it and you have to find all these little kind of symbols, you know, to kind of convey that they can't communicate. One of the themes of the movie is that if you take away, uh, if you take away knowledge, you can oppress the people and that these people are only kept slaves by the fact that they're not allowed to read or write or keep a history. So later, when they find the hidden history that are that, from down in the catacombs, they're able to liberate and free the people. You want me to go with them? Should I stay? I'll go with them. Really, so beautiful. Look at her in that. Yeah. Now this scene uh, uh, coming up, uh, this is uh, actually an homage to uh, a scene in Spartacus where, when he's in the jail cell, they bring him a a slave girl as a as a gift. And, and uh, we were inspired by that scene for, for this sequence here to bring these and two it was characters really kind together. Of interesting to shoot because they were like kind of these seven Mexican, older Mexican ladies, you know, and they didn't understand one word of English, you know, and I think like James was really scared of them <laughs> because they took their job really serious. No, no, please, no more, please. Please, no more. I'm fine. I'm, I'm clean. I'm. I'm, oh, <laughs> I thought you were one of the other cleaning. <laughs> no, 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 you don't, you don't have to do that, please. This was to show that the character is insane. <laughs> <laughs> There he realized he gets her in trouble because obviously this is like a custom of these people. I'm very, I'm very happy. 
Thank you. Again, in the scene, we wanted to show how that the writing was forbidden. But uh, uh, when he tries to show her some writing, she originally resists. But then uh, when she, she, uh, she, she goes along, we realize that she's aware of this secret place that keeps the, the records of their people, the hidden history. Again, the idea being knowledge is power. That was the hardest line of the movie to loop. Do you yeah, remember that? He had to loop that. Because he goes, yeah. ah, 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 ooh, ah, like 30 times. Yeah. <laughs> and he had to redo each one because there was noise problems. On yeah, it. actually, that scene, you know, we had like uh, some problems, you know, in Yuma, Arizona with the weather and uh, or like kind of going from one side to the other. And we kind of squeezed that scene, uh, the scene in and shot it in some kind of like weird warehouse there. You know, it was like uh, very noisy. And so we had to loop some of these uh, scenes we shot in this like, kind of uh, bed chamber or whatever that was. So she erases the mistake mm -hmm. on it and redoes it in the way she's seen it. The same symbol that was on the Stargate. Earth. You, you know, you know the symbol? You know the symbol? You've seen it's also always like a magic when people can't speak to each other, you know. It's always like, a, I think, the most interesting scenes in the movie. It's like kind of a huge model. Now, this was one of the scenes that had been cut out. Yeah. That I think we, we've put back in for the special edition. We'll never get anything in this storm. I'll have to wait till it passes. Yeah, right. If it passes. You know, I was stationed in the Middle East. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand. Why don't we just turn the gate back on ourselves? Yeah, how hard can it That's be? That's Jack Moore and Steve Gianelli, veterans of many Centropolis <laughs> movies. <laughs> vacuum of outer space. Do you have any idea how many possible combinations there are on that thing? No. How many? <laughs> French Stewart is terrific. And I think this is where the scene started, actually, in the released version. Yeah. And the whole landing was like kind of uh, of the spaceship and the pyramid was like a model shoot. And we shot it outside. Uh, uh, what's, this, what's this place called? You know, like in that... Uh, the Chandler? Uh, no, it was... Uh, we later had to move to Chandler, but like... This was like kind of all shot like during this big uh, um, earthquake we had. Oh, right. And, right. Uh, and what happened, you know, we were like shooting these like kind of had this, all these models and stuff out there. And it was like uh, very close to Northridge and uh, Santa Clarita Studios, it's called. We had all these like big construction building cranes and stuff like that. And then the earthquake came and we had to stop shooting, you know, for like, I think like three weeks. and. Repair the models, you know, uh, one camera got trashed, you know, and had to move everything like kind of uh, to Chandler Studios, which is in the valley. So this was a huge, huge, huge kind of setback for us, you know. Luckily, it was covered by insurance, but still we had like we lost all of a sudden like kind of three or four weeks of shooting. Those are opticals, not the not digital yeah, the, effects. The, yeah, the, the optical, you know, like uh, the the lightning is all done like kind of uh, kind of cell animation. But everything else is pretty much all like models. It was a huge kind of like grain which is hidden behind the model and l slowly kind of brings this pyramid down. There were inside lights. And um, we did with huge wind machines, we did, uh, we did uh, the sandstorm. It was quite exciting when we kind of shot it because it was so... Uh, I like model work because, you know, everything what you have filmed is immediately like in the dailies. It's not like kind of a digital or uh, computer-generated effects where it's a slow process. You have to wait a long time to mm -hmm. see anything. To see anything, yeah. All right, spread out. And they have their also like own own feeling. Now here, like kind of, is this like Horus attack, which actually was conceptualized first a little bit differently. But when I first time saw like uh, the actors in these um, uh, in these kind of like kind of suits which were these huge like animal hats you know when I first time saw that 
you know, how they move, you know, I said, this is impossible. They can hardly do anything. So we pretty much like kind of came up with the idea to kind of do the whole scene, you know, with POVs and show the POV of these like attacking creatures instead of seeing them. Which actually was then like actually much more effective because it's a thing that's much more scary when you don't see anything. And the whole set was actually built with all these columns so you can, you know, make a kind of exciting scene because it's all this like kind of maze of like columns where you never see. You can really get lost. Yeah, get lost and nobody sees the other person or what's attacking them. For the first time, we revealed the villain. Mm -hmm. And we tried as best we could to recreate the pose that this same villain had when it was in the petrified stone. But then this time, it turns towards us and comes to life. That's uh, one of my favorite scenes, the cigarette lighter scene. We had a lot of discussion with our executive producer Mario Kusar and, and other people, you know, about that scene. Everybody wanted to always cut the scenes between them and these people, like, shorter, and thought, you know, there's for such a long time, you know, in the movie, no action. But I think, you know, all these scenes, you know, help that you really like these people and you can relate to them and relationships are formed. That's why you care about these people much more. So, like, later when, you know, like, uh, everybody gets in danger, you really care about them. And it was important for us to show how people who can't communicate bridge that gap. I mean, that's really kind of what the movie was about. Uh, you know, we, we were trying to resist the, the cliché in science fiction movies where everybody in all over the universe speaks English. And so, you know, it presented a problem, but it also, I think, made this stuff fun. And, and I, our little anti-smoking scene in here, you know, it was, it was a fun way to let these two characters bond and to show that this one kid really admires the Kurt Russell character. Also, he kind of lost his son, so there's like kind of somewhat, you know... A poignancy to it. Yeah. (coughs) 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 Now, Venise! Ah, you're right. It's pretty stupid. (laughs) Also gives him here the lighter, which later becomes very important. And helps rescue him. And helps rescue him. Which then, like later, in the, when we would have cut out this scene, you know, it would have not made sense at the end. So I think with movies, it's like hard, you know, you go into the editing process. Yeah, sometimes, you know, you know yourself that you have to get shorter or you're going to tell the story faster. No. But also you lose a lot of, like, little things sometimes. And Here he overreacts about the gun because mm-hmm. of the death of his son, mm-hmm. trying to overstress that the guns are dangerous. The rest of his men don't understand the overreaction. Kurt does here a great job. Again, the idea that the original settlers who had come over through the Stargate had kept a history of what had happened to them, but it was hidden here in uh, mm-hmm. in the catacombs. So it was a little bit like inspired by like kind of the catacombs in Rome, where you know like kind of um, when like kind of Christianity was like suppressed, you know, like kind of people used like kind of like these underground burying places to kind of like write down, you know, their beliefs and. That's here's the first time where where he recognizes a word. The idea being that we have no idea how ancient Egyptian really sounded, we all guess. And so suddenly he knows ancient Egyptian, and she's teaching him how to pronounce it correctly. Teal. 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 Uh, Necher? Necheru? Necheru? Nate? Naturu. Nate? Naturu. (laughs) Nafi. (laughs) <laughs> She's so charming. 
This was one of the more beautiful sets in the movie. Yeah, that was actually the biggest set of the movie. They were like kind of when we were shooting in that stage, they were still building and it made us all very nervous. And this is the introduce, introduction of our villain character. Or well, now that he is a villain, since we saw him in, in our new opening. <laughs> now you see him as the reborn like alien so Ra. Again, was like a very kind of complicated, mechanical. The Kid West like designed that, and it always worked. You know, it was always like for me a miracle because there were so many parts to it, and it was quite complicated. And actually, the actor has to had to be in it. Actually, the first time we tried it out, I kind of climbed into it to show the actor that uh, it's safe and. Uh, and uh, some part like kind of like fell on my head the other day. <laughs> no, there's something not there. Me, you, Now he gets to impress his friends with his his new toy. The left side is like what is the character Nabe? It's like a character, you know, where we're like kind of found this like actor when we were like casting Skara and we kind of pretty much like hired him and we didn't have a part for him in a way but like we were so kind of taken by him and he was such a cool actor that uh, he actually comes from Switzerland so we kind of developed during the shooting like this like little side character. We're looking for Jackson. Jackson, the guy wears his jacket. He's, uh, he's got like long hair that comes down. No, 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 no. It wears glasses so he can see. Just the word dweeb doesn't mean anything to you guys, does it? <laughs> Why not? I'm on Planet X looking for a dweeb who wears green fatigues. He wears this jacket. He's got long hair. It comes over his eyes. He wears glasses and <laughs> sneezes. <laughs> you see that like Scar is the smartest of them. Chicken. 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 Chicken man. You got <laughs> <Eagle. laughs> You want this? There were these like scenes were really fun to shoot because like Kurt is really good with kids, you know, and uh, he's always like kind of ready to improvise a little bit. Most of that scene was anyway a little bit improvised and kind of little things added. This was the most complicated thing to get this horse only running for like kind of 10 feet. Because the horse can't see and no. it was a very narrow yeah, and it kind place of, it had to run. You know, we were also like really afraid that like kind of the horse hurts itself and that was really hard. Thought you couldn't what? speak their language. Oh. <laughs> Scared me. <laughs> it's an ancient Egyptian dialect. I mean, like the rest of their culture, it's evolved completely independently, but uh, once you know the vowels... Just answer the question. Well, um, well, I mean, you just, I just had to learn how to pronounce it. I mean, it hasn't been a living spoken language in more than 1,000 years. I mean, look at this. It says uh, a traveler. From this was like kind of a very late addition to the cut. And uh, we wanted to kind of like kind of explain the story a little bit better. And all this kind of part was like kind of shot very late. Originally, the character of Ra was not an alien, but he was put in charge of the planet by an alien. Later, when we were uh, looking at the film at the end, the villain was not scary enough to be a good enough villain uh, uh, for our lead characters. So very late in the game, we decided to turn him uh, from, from a human who was taken uh, and in his, only his body was used, and the alien took over the body. And so this sequence here was a, a late addition to explain the backstory of how uh, the alien took over the body of this young boy and became Ra. And all these little frescoes that I kind of like painted myself because it had to be done really fast and not even time, you know, to kind of hire somebody for it. It was very late in the process. That's why uh, uh, the eye effects for Ra, his uh, voice, all of the, uh, the, the morphing of the, uh, the alien face on top of it, that was all done very late in post-production. 
appointed himself ruler. He used the Stargate to bring thousands of people here to this planet as workers for the mines, just like the one we saw. This mineral is clearly the building block of all his technology. With this, he can sustain eternal life. Now, uh, something happened, where is it, back on Earth, a rebellion or uprising, and the Stargate was buried there. Fearful of a rebellion here, Ra outlawed reading and writing. He didn't want the people to remember the truth. Jackson, I think you better take a look at this. That's it. That's what we're looking for. They must have hidden it here in hopes that one day the gate on Earth could be reopened. I knew they'd have it written down someplace. Wait a minute. Where's the seven symbol? It must have broken. It's got to be here somewhere. It's got it. Got it here. <laughs> now he kind of like sees that the uh, symbol is gone and there. Uh, Seems like kind of this trend right, for good. Kowalski, round. And this is our little goodbye scene that even though he's bonded with this local girl, he has to leave before he gets to really know her. Of course, what he doesn't understand is in their custom, when she was given to him, she's now his wife, but he doesn't know that. Also, like, kind of, again, this whole, like, kind of complex was shot, you know, like, in the early morning hours, and it was quite difficult because, uh, first of all, you go out in the desert and there's no light. So you're, like, with flashlights, have to kind of position your camera and you kind of have to scout it beforehand really carefully. And then we shot this whole sequence, like, over, like, kind of six mornings, you know. Every time we had, like, to get up uh, out of bed at, like, kind of 3.30 in the morning, drive out there. And there's now the pyramid mm -hmm. with the spaceship on top of it, which mm -hmm. they had not seen mm -hmm. before. What the hell is that? Here. You might need this. It doesn't look that steep, but that was actually pretty hard for them to run yeah. up that hill. <laughs> Again, in action sequence, we tried to play more on suspense than on, on what, more on what you don't see than on what you do see. Kind of like one little shot where he kind of gets thrown in the wall. We simply kind of turn the wall, put it on the ground, and they simply drop them on it. Why are we going to the Stargate? I can't make it work. Stay right here and shoot anything that comes down that ramp. What are you doing? Just cover me. And while it may seem simple in, in the end, the, these these rings were one of the great headaches of the movie. Yeah. What is that? Now he discovers that the nuclear weapon has been taken. And just then, the villains appear. But these rings were like kind of a combination. This actually is like kind of CG rings. And, uh, but like we also had them as like kind of mechanical mechanical ones where we had then only like kind of uh, erased later the metal rods they were kind of sliding on. But they were like kind of pain in the air neck, these things. I never quite wanted to work. 
Put it down, Jackson. See, all these kind of like kind of movements were like don't have the big rings, and this is like a marble. Some people never really understood the idea here was that yeah. this was a transporter that took them down from the basement of the pyramid that was really there and then up into the spaceship. And so now they're up in the spaceship portion of it. Now this we originally had built as a model, but the model never really moved right, so we decided to go with the CG one and we were pretty happy with the results. Yeah, and it's also kind of where we did the first like kind of you know, work in CG and got a little more like kind of uh, familiar with it and that part there is a model. Yeah. But that's CG. Now comes the big uh, staircase scene. It's like in a musical, MGM musical <laughs> from the 30s and 40s. <laughs> But this was really our attempt to try and bridge the gap between an ancient Egyptian epic and a science fiction movie of letting the two collide together using images that are familiar, but then twisting it with science fiction. This is also like kind of probably the, the piece of music I like the best. It's the Ross theme. The Ross theme, especially here when the choir comes in. We recorded the music in uh, in London. And the choir is actually singing in ancient Egyptian as well. And actually, the, the, the Ra, when he comes down, is actually a stunt or like kind of body double because uh, uh, it was really hard to wear this mask because it was this kind of like piece of kind of rubber glue to your face and uh, to make the head not too, too big looking. and. Uh, the idea is that Ra takes the most beautiful of the children and makes them his personal guards, and he raises them around him. Also, they were like, again, like Mexican kids, you know, from like the Yuma area, and they had to run around with these haircuts like for the longest time. And here, this is like kind of a CG effect, you know, where like kind of... The metallic headdresses yeah, retract. headdresses retracting. And it's That's like, Jaiman Hunso from the fame of... Uh, it did uh, like Amistad. Amistad, yes. The, Lead so, in Amistad. Those of you who think he was discovered in that movie, <laughs> we discovered him first. <laughs> and that's Jay Davidson. There's actually kind of like uh, a lot of stories to tell about Jay. But for re legal reasons, we won't go into them on this. <laughs> no. no, he was like kind of amazing. I mean, it's one of the most amazing people I've ever met. This was a kind of a chilling idea. It actually came from uh, our executive producer, Mario Gassar, that rather than high technology to protect himself, he simply surrounds himself with the children. Because he knows these guys will not shoot at him then. That's German. Hot time. The burning eyes again, an effect we added very late. Now, of course, he, is, he assumes that, that, that this person is pretending to be him. Again, in classic hero myths, there's usually a scene in, uh, involving water and a near-death moment. So we tried to incorporate that here as in their prison cells. Again, the combination of models and CG planes. Yes, yes. 
yes, yes, yes. These were actually models. This was CG. Now this whole attack sequence again was something that Roland added very late. Originally we only had the aftermath of the battle, that we didn't see the battle, but it felt missing. We wanted to see the villains being villainous. So this sequence was added uh, after the fact using some existing footage from previous scenes and then some new footage that Roland shot over a weekend. I didn't have much uh, set, so I kind of shot everything like kind of very tight and kind of intercut it with some wider model shots. That's Patrick Tatopoulos' child, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you see, all these kind of shots are very tight and they were quite effective because, you know, you get the feeling that these people get punished for having done nothing. And when the Shepherd Boys arrive, this is now where we originally had the scene begin in the aftermath. But I think that it added a lot to see what the brutality and that the brutality had been senseless. He kind of slowly and very carefully kind of introduced like subtitles. I didn't want to do too early subtitles because when when the people don't need to understand each other yet, you know, it was would have been like kind of uh, well, it didn't work because uh, you know it was like about like kind of learning the language, but now. It's like Daniel has learned the language, you know, we kind of slowly kind of hear in the f scene first, like uh, first time, like kind of use subtitles because later in the movie we use it more when, when like uh, a James Bader character kind of talks with um, Ra, which is coming up. So James Spader has now had his wound healed by the sarcophagus device, which he we will learn is the device that has kept uh, the body of Ra young for these last 10,000 years. Also we wanted to make this kind of thing like sound like stone, so it's some kind of te technology you, you don't really, you know, see on Earth, you know, that like a... These poor kids like... had to shave their head. <laughs> yeah. It was like kind of a favorite sound in the whole movie that we constantly kind of uh, use stone rumble, we call it, you know, like kind of grinding stone, you know, use it for all kinds of uh, parts in the movie. Now this scene was a scene that, that uh, is added for the special edition uh, that we originally cut out in the interest of time. But we always thought this was a really great creepy scene as he uh, begins to find out a little bit more about the uh, Ra's palace. So we get to see him exploring the palace a little bit and, and heading into the to Ra's private bath chamber. The best film cat I've ever seen in my life. She did exactly what you wanted her to do. Normally, like uh, the shoot of animals and kids is like kind of uh, really complicated, but uh, in that case, this cat was so. This amazing. part here, the bath scene, this was not in the the uh, released version. It was like Joseph Perot, the costume designer, was so proud of these shoes. <laughs> it's the, he also designed not only the clothes, he also designed all this like kind of jewelry. But this gives you a sense of, of the way he's Ra is pampered by the people around him and how eerie and creepy it is, the way he enslaves the people around him. I'm, I'm really glad we get to put this mm -hmm. back in. Oh, there's always something creepy when, like, kind of kids have to kind of work as servants. 
because it is a very kind of makes him like very dangerous and and bad in a way. And Jay's face is really perfect for this because he does look like an Egyptian, as we've seen in the old drawings. And kind of in the contrast, you know, the voice, the voice like sounds like from some kind of monster or something, which is a good contrast to his looks. And to give us the feeling that the alien resides from within his body, but not, not perhaps in harmony with the body. It was tough to shoot because most actors like kind of, uh, or act, you know, because they both speak like some language they have no idea about. So, but it's uh, like kind of, um, what was his name again? Like the Stuart? Stuart Smith. Stuart Smith, you know, he kind of helped a lot. I'm constantly trained with them, you know, the, the lines. No, no. The costumes were just fantastic. Yeah. And again, the illusion of a god and using mythology of gods to control people. It was always a theme of the movie. <laughs> The idea being that he can only regain the mythology if uh, the character of Daniel kills his friends in front of everyone and is obeying Ra as the one true authority. This scene is a scene we almost didn't even get to, to have in the picture because we'd ran out of time to shoot it, but we felt we needed it. And Dean shot it. <laughs> so we shot this on second unit to show how the, uh, the kids were gathering together and learning the real history of their people. And as they learn this history, again, this knowledge becomes power and they decide to begin the revolution when they learn that Ra is not really a god. It's also quite risky to have so much subtitle in a mainstream movie, but we kind of felt, you know, this would be, you know, like kind of stupid to let the people speak English, so, or we're like actually pretty proud of it to do. This is a beautiful scene. I mean, just the images. So here, like, you know, the body double for like Ra had to kind of like, had this mask on in like 130 degrees. <laughs> Well, this is one of our biggest extra yeah, days, too. Yeah. Now you could like kind of easily kind of do most of these extra scenes, you know, with uh, uh, digital extras. But at that time, this was like really not possible. We did some tests, but simply not didn't look quite good. <laughs> So suddenly our character of Daniel has a terrible choice on his hand. If he doesn't kill his friends, everyone who had seen them will be murdered. These scenes really added a lot to the size of the movie and gave it a real epic feel, I think. Great little music yeah, cue. The, little, the lighter into play. And suddenly Daniel sees that he has some support from out in the field. Again, the music helps us tremendously here. And the kids, which I think is great, they shoot in the air. Because they just want to cause chaos. They don't want to hurt anyone. Here was the only day where the sun left us in Yuma, Arizona. I was not happy about that. 
It's hardly in the movie, but... Uh, and here it's like it's not an original version either. Okay then, that part, where they're right away. Oh yeah, yeah. the escape on the yeah. mastage. Before they just ran off. Yeah. There's probably then also the sandstorm scene back in, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's great. True. The original idea is that they've run off on their own with they've gotten on the master mattress has, has taken them off far away, but they get caught in a sandstorm out in the middle of the night. Yes. Oh, I always loved this scene. Yeah. The horse didn't like the wind very much, but uh, at least like walked like for thirty steps. <laughs> And then never ever walked again. <laughs> we had dozens of giant wind machines blowing oh, yeah. sand was, everywhere. This was really yeah, hard to shoot. It was hard for the actors. And that the horse like comes back was like a miracle. And the idea that the kids have gone off into the sandstorm searching for them, which I think is, is really great, that they're rescued by the, the children. There's the model shot. And again, it was the Mastage crying out because the Mastage felt a bond with Daniel, and it was the sound of the Mastage that drew the kids to them. Again, paying off something we set up very early when he gave the candy bar to the Mastage. It's nice to have that back in the picture. That's a great shot. It's an effect shot. And now suddenly a rebel movement has been formed. Here, Colonel. Yes. <coughs> so what do you think? And they're not exactly special forces, but they sure were eager to join up. Take these guns away, Lieutenant, before they hurt themselves. And it like, comes back to like kind of Kurt's character, kind of hating that like kind of kids have weapons in their hands. There's no place for these kids to go. Anyway, we could sure use their help right now. For what? Huh? To do what? Why don't you just tell him everything? Why don't you tell him about the bomb? What's he talking about? It's like the big moment where he reveals a secret. My orders were simple. Track down signs of any possible danger. I think it does a great job there. If I found any, blow up the Stargate. Well, I found some. Well, your bomb is his now. And tomorrow he's going to send it back to Earth, along with the shipment of that mineral they mine here. And when that thing goes off, it's going to cause an explosion a hundred times more destructive than that bomb alone is capable. Here we added actually also very late, like one close up of James and had to kind of put him in a wig. And <laughs> I still, and I kind of see that shot, I know he has a wig on, even like probably the regular, you know, person doesn't see it, but like I see it and it always bugs me. That's exactly what I'm going to do. It's the gate on Earth that poses a threat. That's the one that we have to shut down. You're absolutely right. But since you don't know how to get us back, we don't have that option, do we? the typical like kind of moment before like the third act comes where it, all hope is lost you know and our two heroes our somewhat two blame heroes each other blame each other it's also a scene you know we like had not in the original I think the lead up to it you know the lead up to it I don't remember I think that part be But this is again to show how brutal he is with his man. Mm -hmm. Also a fact that we didn't have in there. It's like it was a little scene where we always seem to see that these shepherd boys like kind of feed the animals. Mm -hmm. Simply adds a little atmosphere, you know, but uh, in the final version we kind of cut it out to kind of for time reasons. You would accept the fact that... No it always hurts, you know, because all these, like, effect shots, you know, were a lot of work, and, you know. 
And this is where James Spader realizes that that his partner here was suicidal and had never intended to go home in the first place. I had a family. And he finds out why. No one should ever have to outlive their own child. Now that was a line someone actually said to me in real life when, when they, they had outlived their child. And when they said it, it, it just put chills in my spine. And I really wanted to put that into the picture to, to capture that feeling. In such a hurry to. But he may have lost his child. But this one may bring him hope to fight another day. That's right. The first part of that scene we didn't have in before, no. but the second half yeah, we had in the half. release version. Like where Rob punishes his own people. There's Chiman again. So proud of Chiman. <laughs> you was right to know. This actually was like a stunt guy really like pulled in a cable like through this room and there was like no padding so it's quite dangerous for the stunt guy to do that. And this is an interesting effect where we yeah. sped the film up to give the idea of this intensity that's shaking the guy's head. We actually shot it, we didn't do this optically, we did this because this has another kind of like motion blur when you do it in camera. You could not do this like kind of, uh, it would be hard to do that. And without any real blood or anything, it becomes very, very uh, effective. You really feel the brutality of it. Also in contrast to see all these people having like, kind of having fun and you really like these people because they And this is when he realizes that the people think that he's married to, you know, to Shaori. And this is her big embarrassment because he never accepted her. And I think this, again, it just adds a character thing that makes you care about these people and, and want our heroes to win in the third act. It's exactly the kind of thing that the studio wanted us to cut out. <laughs> and she plays this so beautifully. You have to sign more. I did you know, sorry. Yes, I did. I think that's why. Not that. The the marionette. Hey. Beautiful. That was a real sandstorm that just happened while we were out there. And Roland ran out with the camera and said, wait, I've got to shoot this. I've got to shoot this. It'll be great for a transition. <laughs> there was like kind of this, this set I kind of started after like a couple of days to hate. This was this like little cave, you know, we were, didn't have much money anymore. So the cave, you know, this like hideout got smaller and smaller. <laughs> And, you know, I knew that we had to have to shoot in this, like, kind of set, like, at least for, like, kind of six, seven, eight days. And it was very, very tight and, and it was very hard on the actors and the crew kind of to work in it. And when we finally were finished in this cave, you know, we were so happy. Here our, our hero discovers the seventh symbol. This is a symbol for this planet. And again, the idea that, that he's able to communicate with someone else from a whole other culture and another planet. What are you doing? I found it. What are you talking about? The seventh sim? Now there's a reason to fight. We're going home. Oh, <laughs> 
dahil! But again, dealing all in mythology, they've shot a god, and everyone's afraid of what, of what the result will be. So they have to prove to everyone that it was not a god at all. Give me my a turuti. Give me my. Marvel shirt with real sky background. This is an old fashioned technique of parallel cutting two events happening at the same time, and which will happen first? Will the bomb get sent back to Earth first, or will our heroes get there and stop it? And it's fun to, to parallel cut these two actions. And these poor guys had always to walk with these hats on <laughs> and they hardly saw anything. <laughs> or here they had to kind of like stand, you know, in these like kind of metal contraption on the head and the, and, and the heat. So it's like kind of looks now like kind of pretty easy but it was like this is our trojan undertaking our trojan horse scene where they're disguised as the uh, the shepherd boys who bring in the minerals but it's actually our heroes trying to get inside the fortress what's happening out there but they only let the first one in before they they stop letting more up <laughs> doing hmm? <laughs> only Kurt Russell can pull that off <laughs> <laughs> the best damn come on buddy so now the big showdown begins and this is quite a complicated uh, action sequence because we have what happens outside behind the wall what's happening inside and what's happening above, all trying to interplay with each other. And he thinks like, uh, Skara has been killed. And once again, he's lost his child, but this time he has the opportunity to fight back. That was the favorite. Was the, no, those the, are CG ones. Yeah, that was the most f uh, favorite thing to say from the crew. Miu, miu, whenever <laughs> something happened. <laughs> certain like kind of lines of a movie or certain words of a movie become totally like the inside joke of like the the, the crew members. We're dead. We're talking like that. Well, what are we gonna do? Cover me. Cover you. A lot of these kind of like flying uh, uh, alien gliders, uh, you know, was, was really done like uh, models on, on wires uh, and they were shot in the desert, you know, in the real sand dunes. We had like a second unit going for like kind of at least like kind of four weeks. And we simply told them like shoot as many kind of, you know, of these sh uh, shots uh, in, in real. Uh, because it simply reduced our like CG and other but you know, visual effect budgets and everything what you can do in real, you know, you should anyway do in real. And it was simply kind of... Uh, so Kurt Russell gets there first and the bomb is waiting.
What are you doing? Completing this mission. Now their character arcs come to a head. Where does one really want to succeed, or does he really just want to commit suicide? I'm going to stay here, make sure this goes off. And that's when he realizes that he doesn't want to live. You got seven minutes. Daniel! Rita! But Daniel remembers that the sarcophagus was able to bring him back to life, and maybe it could bring her back to life. The rings again. Like during editing, we did so many like uh, versions of the scene. Was this is actually one of my favorite moments. James Bader hated the line, but he was so good in this. You really get the feeling. Jackson, wait for me. Now this was a particularly hard fight scene to shoot. Bomb now like also works as the ticking clock for the... That was a very hard effect yeah. to do because not only was the character moving, but there was fire going on behind him. Mm -hmm. So that depended on the fire back, back in. We had to do this fight scene on the second unit and it, it, because we had a very small crew to do this while we're shooting everything else in the soundstage right next to it. It took about two weeks to shoot this fight sequence. Again, to add some consequence to it, here's a character that we've come to love as a, one of the cute Mastage boys. And then he gets it. No, I still wonder, like, kind of how, like, kind of... Uh Jay Davidson could like walk in this thing. <laughs> he has under. You got any rounds at all for any? We're all out of ammo. There's also like a uh, structurally, you know, to see that like there's still like kind of no hope, like kind of everybody is like kind of battling his own fight, like Kurt here with like Anubis, like uh James Bader is like trying to kind of revive, you know, his love and the kids out there like kind of fighting these um, alien fighters, you know, it's a pretty hopeless fight. Kowalski, we gotta do something. This was a shot where we like kind of simply put the actor under this construction, which you know the, the model, model, you know, was like kind of uh, flew by on wires, you know, and it worked, you know, it makes it very weird looking. So he's revived his love, but can he get her back in time? Again, those are models on up on the hill. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
And because we had shown him do it with the soldier, we now know how powerful that thing is he's doing to Daniel. So it adds this fear factor. Is he going to scramble Daniel's brains like he did the other soldier? Or will Kurt Russell do what he needs to do fast enough? Regards to King Todd, asshole. <laughs> it was the 80s. We were at Carol Co. Give us a break. You needed those kind of lines. <laughs> but this was great. Only his head gets beamed up. The rest stays down. I always loved that. He gets it back, falls back down, and grabs and vanishes. Now that scream, by the way, is Dean Devlin. Yeah. <laughs> I looped that screen. <laughs> and that growl. <laughs> so finally he can take the key out of the bomb. But it keeps on ticking. That's the classic cavalry, cavalry arrives scene. And now the whole rest of the village, who's come, become convinced that the gods are not the gods, have come to join. And this gives us really some of our most spectacular stuff of the movie. Where it's really like the old-fashioned epic adventures. And musically, again, one of the best cues. It's always like this kind of music was used a lot in trailers of other other movies. Other movies, because it's so uplifting, and you really get this feeling. And of here, there's like a, in, in the biggest shot here, you know, we had like kind of all the people running down there, and uh, one of the extras, you know, for some odd reason, you know, was running all of a sudden to another camera which was on the side, and they were told to go run to the middle camera. And then everybody like like ran the the lemons, you know, like kind of followed him and like kind of a whole big sand dune was ruined. But it was also the kind of like uh, the evening when uh, the sandstorm hit us. So like the next morning we could do the shot again. So we got really lucky on that one. Then the idea of replaying what what we'd like to believe happened on Earth when the Stargate was originally buried. Once again, the people uprose and overthrew their oppressors. Seeing this, Ra decides to make his escape and begins to activate the spaceship to get to get out of Dodge. So I have to do something. I've got an idea. It's always great when you can take a weapon and turn it against the villain. Now here, where we see the alien face from within, that again, that was added very late.
<laughs> Why am I shooting that? Here we kind of like, uh, because we didn't have enough extras, we moved the extras, you know, from left to the middle and then to the right, and then combined these three shots to one shot. It was one of my favorite moments in the movie, where the kid comes to him and salutes him. And the kiss. You gotta have the kiss. <laughs> <laughs> but Kurt's reaction to it, I think, takes all the curse off of it. Now that's a character who was going to play a nice role in the sequel, but then they killed him on the TV series. <laughs> Which they killed him? Who? They killed that. They killed Ferretti in the first episode yeah. of the TV series. <laughs> How can they do that? Are you going to be all right? But this was always a really nice goodbye scene. I thought that he decides to stay with her. I'm going to be all right. How about you? And he decides to go on and live. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Again, Kurt Russell can do a lot with a little. Tell Catherine this brought me luck. And the symbol goes back home to its rightful owner. I will. I'll be seeing you around. Dr. Jackson? and finally gives him respect for the first time in the movie. And then we have to throw this effect in one last time so that people can go out with one last little fun <laughs> bit. <laughs> and we just felt it had to say the end, because that's the kind of movie we're emulating. And that's Stargate. <laughs> <laughs>